Hello, I've got your video right now on the market revolution, which is lesson number eight. And I want to look at this difference between how the economy was at the beginning of the 1800s versus what it is today. And in the 17th and 18th centuries, we have what's called the moral economy. Uh, it was not a period in time where you were worried about making money. There was no such thing really as capitalism. There was just existing. So you grow food, but the food is just for your own use. You're not selling it. Uh, you're trading goods and services with your neighbors. And there might be a personal credit system, but it's not like today. Uh, if you get too far in debt, then you'll be released from your debts. If there is a surplus of crops, then you might be able to sell that to pay your taxes, but it's not to make a profit at all. It's just the bare minimum to exist. Women are going to have different duties from men, but together women and men are going to create the household economy. So women are going to be responsible for the ke keeping up of the house. Uh, they're going to be responsible for the cooking, preserving the food, taking care of the gardens, taking care of the poultry, the dairy animals, uh, making textiles, spinning, weaving, dyeing, quilting, sewing, mending, you name it. Uh, men are going to attend to the field crops, the livestock, they're going to build the buildings, they're going to chop the firewood, hunt, fish, uh, things like that. So we have a household economy, but in many ways we have two family economies that combine to be one. The woman's economy, the man's economy, together make up the household economy. What's really interesting about this time period is that we have a very good representation of it. Uh, there was a woman named Martha Ballard who grew up in Maine with her husband Ephraim. And she lived from 1735 to 1812 in the city of Hallowell. And she left a diary. And there are over 10,000 entries that cover 27 years of her life. So we know all about what her economy was like. She baked and she brewed, she pickled, she preserved, she made soap, she made candles, she spun and wove cloth. But on top of that, she was also a midwife. So she was personally responsible for bringing 816 babies into the world and then present at over a thousand births. So we know all about what she did uh, if anybody's interested in that, her story has been made into a, a book, a historical uh, work called The Midwife's Tale of the Life of Martha Ballard based on her diary. But when we get to the early 19th century, the early 1800s, we get this shift from a pre-capitalist society to capitalism. And people start to want to earn money and they start to want to earn profits and people begin growing food specifically to sell and there are going to be goods that are produced specifically for market and the money that you make from these transactions will be used specifically to fund product for more transactions so we get this idea of capitalism thanks to a guy named adam smith of england this shift from the moral economy to the market economy, it's going to start this whole specialization of labor. And a lot of this is going to start in England. Um, and here's some reasons why Britain is where it starts. But because Britain and the United States are very closely aligned, this idea of industrialization, this idea of specialization of labor, it will come to America very quickly. It really starts with a textile industry. In 1793, a guy named Samuel Slater is going to open up the first textile mill in the United States that can be considered modern. And by 1825, the idea of textile production is spread all throughout New England. And the best example of it is gonna be found outside Boston in uh, Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh, by 1914, believe it or not, the United States has the world's largest industrial economy. We go from nothing to being the largest producer of pretty much everything in a little bit over 100 years. 
<clears throat> so what's going to lead to this change? There are a couple of things that lead to this change from the moral economy to the market economy. There are a couple of things that lead to this specialization of labor. And one is just industrialization itself. Textile mills are going to bring textiles into the home on a mass-produced scale. Originally, you would make most of the clothes at home. But eventually, we come to something known as the cottage system or the putting out system. Basically, um, I own a large field or a large you know, group of sheep or something like that. And instead of turning all the thread into or turn all of the raw product into thread myself, I'm going to let the local women do it for me. I give them the thread or I should say I give them the cotton or I give them the sheep wool. They turn the thread and I buy it back from them. So I've got a bunch of thread now. Uh, I don't want to weave the thread into cloth myself, so I give it to somebody else and buy the, the finished cloth back from them and so on and so on. So each time, each step of the work, I'm putting it out to somebody else to do and then buying it back. Eventually, these early mill owners say, why don't I just have the workers come to me? And slowly but surely, all of this different work, instead of putting it out to other people, it's going to be done in my factory or in my mill or in my house. That's a really big shift because no longer are you, the worker, in charge of your work. Whoever it is that you're working for is going to be in charge of your work. So it's a huge change in the way that we look at, at um, work and production. Beginning in the 1790s, instead of being completely human powered, some of these mills are going to switch to being water powered. And then eventually in the 1840s, they're going to become steam powered. We have the Waltham system of Lowell, Massachusetts. This is going to be the first textile mill that puts it all together where um, the work is going to be done in-house. There's water powered looms and eventually steam powered looms. And all the spinning, cutting, and weaving will be done in one place. The end result is the textiles that are produced at the Lowell, Massachusetts mill are cheaper than anything you could make yourself. Instead of making your own cloth, you're now going to turn to this mass-produced cloth. Who's working at this mill, by the way? Young women. Um, most of the workers are going to be young women from New England farmers. Some are under 10. Most of them leave the mill by the, their middle 20s, which is when they get married. Uh, it was not seen as proper for a married woman to work at the time. The young girls who are doing the work, they don't really get to keep much of the money. The, the money is being given to a male member of their family. And the conditions are extremely harsh. Um, they are provided dorms, they're provided meals, they are provided stuff, but there's often six or more people per dorm uh, inside the textile mill. The machinery doesn't stop, the windows have to be closed, and so you start breathing in a lot of dust and fabric, and, and then the machines are dangerous, and the hours are dangerous. And mill workers, honestly, they're going to take advantage of these workers as often as they can. The mill owners will speed up work, cut costs, uh, cut pay, and still require these girls to produce the same amount of cloth. We get some new inventions that are going to um, really make this go on a little bit further. The flying shuttle, which is going to allow... Uh, larger and larger and more and more fabrics to be weaved together. The spinning jenny is going to let you do more spools of thread at the same time. The water frame will take the loom and make it water powered. The spinning mule combines the jenny and the frame together. And then the power loom is going to be a steam powered loom that can produce finished cloth. Each one of these is going to allow um, textiles to be done quicker, cheaper, and faster. Now we just got to look also at some technologies. Uh, we got interchangeable parts. The idea of interchangeable parts, we, we just, you know, if something breaks today, we just go to the store and fix it. But once upon a time that wasn't possible, it was thought of as being too expensive. Eli Whitney, who we know better as the inventor of the cotton gin, came up with the idea of interchangeable parts. He hypothesized 
that if you make machinery that is very exact, then you can produce exact replicas of whatever breaks. And the idea was if you build these very, very exact machines, these, um, I don't know, how do, how do I want to say it? These exact replica making machines, that instead of throwing away the whole machine when it breaks, you just replace that part. And by doing this, yes, there's a high startup cost with making these machines that can do the exact replicas. In the end, your cost will go lower because you don't have to continually replace entire machines. Transportation is a technology. We just don't really think of it that way. Uh, roads are going to be built. Canals are going to be built. Most famously, the Erie Canal, which connected New York City with the middle part of the country. And the Erie Canal is going to be what creates the cities of Detroit, Milwaukee, and Chicago and makes them major cities today. Uh, of those, Milwaukee and Chicago are going to be the absolute largest of them, the most important ones. Um, that might be a question on the, fun, or on the midterm exam, so keep an eye on that. Railroads are going to be probably the biggest transportation development. Uh, beginning around 1830, railroads are going to expand, especially when coal is discovered in Pennsylvania. And by 1850, there's 9,000 miles of track laid. By 1860, there's over 30,000 miles of track laid. And the railroads, they can go year-round, rain, sleet, snow, hail, doesn't matter. Uh, the downside to the railroads, though, is that a lot of the railroad lines don't connect with each other, and if they do, they're not necessarily the same gauge, meaning the same track size. On water, steamships will start replacing sailing ships, which lets you ship quicker, and then the steamships are also going to be larger than the sailing ships ever were. The last of these technologies I think you need to know about, it's just the telegraph. The telegraph is going to be invented by Samuel Morse in the early 1840s, and that along with the telegram and Morse code are going to allow like near instant communication. From New York to London, instead of messages taking three to four months, it was something like six to ten minutes you could get a message across the Atlantic Ocean. So why is that important? You can start doing orders. You can start communicating with people. It leads to journalism. You can be in the middle of Nebraska and order something from France and it'd be there in a couple of weeks. So communication is going to be a big technology that drives this idea of capitalism and this change to a market-based economy. Last but not least, another thing that's going to uh, really start this change to this um, market economy, urbanization. As cities become more and more important, more and more industry and businesses are going to be relocated in these cities. And these cities become import-export hubs, they become uh, immigration hubs, they become centers for business and financing and investing. And New York City is going to become the primary port of the United States. Savannah is also an important city then, and Savannah is an important city now. It's in the top 10 of all U.S. port cities. Um, as far as migration goes, there are some people that come from the countryside into the cities to work for like Lowell, Massachusetts, or in industry in New York City, places like that. But there's also outside immigration. Irish start coming to America in big numbers in the 1840s because of the potato famine. Germans start coming to America in the 1850s because of political issues. And British are coming over pretty consistently to help with the idea of industrializing America. In the cities, corporations are going to be formed. And the federal businesses, or I should say the federal government is going to start investing in these businesses that are opening in the cities. Before you know it, that idea of the moral world, the moral economy is gone. You're no longer just growing food or making stuff for yourself. Everybody wants to try and make money and making a profit becomes the way that this world works. All right. Final thing for this stuff that's going to be on the midterm exam. I will send out an email about this, but some of the things that you need to do 
Go back and watch these video lectures. If you've never seen one before now, I've put one up for each of the lectures. And my test is going to be taken from the stuff I have shared with you in these PowerPoints. Uh, some of the topics, uh, Native Americans and African cultures from the first lecture. The Columbian Exchange, that was from, I think, the second lecture. Uh, English colonization, look back at Roanoke, Jamestown, the Puritans. Uh, look at the Quakers and William Penn. Look at um, um, James Oglethorpe in the way that the United States, or not the United States, but James Oglethorpe in the way that uh, Georgia was founded. Go look at the Great Awakening uh, with, with um, Jonathan Edwards and George Whitefield. Uh, the Seven Years' War and the taxes that followed the Seven Years' War especially. That goes along with the causes of the American Revolution and the fact that we won the American Revolution. A look at how the Constitution was formed and the reasons the Articles of Confederation failed. Then look at the first government of Washington. Look at who the, the um, secretaries were, what happened with John Adams, and then Thomas Jefferson. And um, I think I have a question on the War of 1812 in there too. And last but not least, if you didn't do it the first time, read Common Sense. If you did read it the first time, go reread Common Sense. The, the essay question is about Common Sense. All right, um, if you have any questions, send me an email. And the midterm exam will be open Wednesday, which is the 11th at 12 o'clock a.m. And it will be open until Tuesday the 17th, I think it is, at 11.59 p.m. It is a proctored exam. So if you're not going to take it in person at a West Georgia Tech library location, you will have to download the Respondus Lockdown browser. All right, uh, look forward to hearing from you, and good luck. Talk to you soon.